David, do you have questions? Yeah. No, Kevin has one, then I have a question. All right, I'm sure you do. I have a bunch of questions, actually. But, um, and what that, I, hopefully, at some point today, we'll talk more about this idea of citizen science and how art sort of intersects with that. But I guess my question is, so when we, when we talk, probably when we talk about data into art, we use words like visualization or uh, representation or words like that, which I think seem, seem sort of inadequate to what, what you guys are doing. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that the space between the data and the final product. What is going on there? Is it, is it interpretive? Is it, how would you describe that? <laughs> um, I think that in, in the weather station um, project, the data became kind of a way of thinking about a situation over time because the data was allowing you to kind of think about the, the same situation that you're in the moment now, but over in the past and potentially in the future. So it's kind of like a, a broadening in that sense. Yeah. Um, I guess my feeling is, is every presentation of data is an interpretation, right? You know, like like famously, you know, any map you can't actually represent all of the complexity of reality on any one map. You always have to make a selection, and that selection implies an interpretation. So, I don't know that that actually gets to your question though about whether the right words are visualization and representation and so forth. But, but we actually can't see, we can't actually comprehend the world in all of its diversity. We always have to interpret it through some some kind of lens. And some selection. What are your independent goals for your work? Because it's a good place to start and understand and then see how it sort of moves from there. Yeah, what are your goals? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm really interested in, in, in how we understand, how, how to use science in a way that is understanding where we are in a sense and then using that understanding to We as love, humans? Sorry? So um, when you say where we are, we as yeah, humans? Yeah, I mean, or? I guess, I, guess I, I mean, um, I'm interested in kind of like taking what we know and leveraging that towards things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, or, or the ways that we, um, so, so taking familiar circumstances and like twisting them into ways of understanding things that we don't understand, like the, like the Sonic Planetarium thing, or like taking well, what do we know about these things and what can we have, and then if we could make a whole structure that's a model of that, then it kind of leads us into understanding something different about that, about the place that we're in, mm -hmm. even if that place is farther away, you know? So I guess, um, I guess in terms of goals is to keep doing that more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, I mean, there's the sort of scientific role, which is to learn things about the world that we didn't know before. Um, but I work in a mission-oriented organization, and the mission is to create a just, lasting world for all of us, including nature. I wanted to talk about art also as a kind of tool for emotion generation, or empathy, or, you know, and like experience. So there's the objects and getting the objects after the fact, and there's the art that also gets people in places having experiences together, right? And so that's a whole other type of art that's not neither exactly data visualization nor you know ab completely ab abstract aesthetic experience. There's something in between too. And I, you know, Matt and I have worked together. I've worked with other artists who are specifically like the opportunity to work in nature, collecting data, or having like getting citizens of some sort, you know, to have an experience of collecting data is not necessarily about the importance of the data that they're collecting, but getting them into the mindset of what it means that there's data all around them and what it means in terms of a relationship to a space or a phenomenon that they can seem abstract or distant from their life. How did Eric and Heidi, how did you choose to navigate some of these questions about, um, in your case, for, you're throwing these data out there, did you have any expectations or direction for, for people, or did you, were you throwing it out of the wind? And likewise for you, Heidi, as you were a receiver of some of these data, did you, did you want to be, uh, constrained in any way or, or directed in any way, or did you want the freedom to do what you what you would imagine? Um, at, as a project organizer, I wanted people to have as wide a range of, um, of just respond to it how they, how they would like to. So like in some, and it was really interesting, like um, some, some artists were really 
grabbed onto the data and really used it, like and really wanted to. And even if they hadn't um, previously ever used data before, they wanted to try. And then some were kind of like data, meh. <laughs> but again, they, they were like, I want to, you know, um, think about weather in a broader context. And that and the weather station was like all about that. Like we wanted that to be what it, what it was about. Um, and but as a as an artist, I, I like if I were to be receiving data and asked to use it, I think I would I would want the choice to be able to interpret it or do whatever I wanted with it. You know, I would like that, I guess. Okay, um, I'm interested uh, in a little, and I'm sorry, your first name? Mark. 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 And Jennifer. Jennifer, right, right. You know, because it represents for me uh, a lot of what um, I have to be conscious of. And that's the third leg of the stool. We have the art, the science, and then the third leg for me is the public. Whether we look at it as an audience, we'll, we'll, whether we you know, frame public as an audience or a viewer or a receiver. But uh, I'm very, very interested uh, for completely different, well, related but different reasons in this, what I would call a kind of tension. You know, maybe a friendly tension between uh, data that's being gathered for specific decision making or information and data that is then gathered uh, for reinterpretation or visualization and it could be aesthetic or imaginative or interpretive through the artist's lens. And there's a little bit of tension there when it comes, uh, potentially, when it comes to the public. So, and that tension can take different forms, meaning, and sort of like, how does the public understand the intention? perhaps, in any given relationship between an artist and a scientist, if then that product or that experience is brought into the public in any variety of ways. And so that's, I don't know if there's a nice neat, I don't think there is a nice neat answer for that, but that's kind of a piece I'm working on. What is an example of the tension you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by the tension. Well, this is kind of oversimplification, well, maybe not, but let's just say, um, it's weather and uh, attention, an example of attention. And again, it's not necessarily negative. It's just, uh, it's just like sailors sailing. Um, you know, if I'm offshore and I'm sailing, I'm gathering data constantly, weather data, as much as possible, and positioning and things like that. Okay, now that, that has a real, very serious impact potentially on how I interpret that. Um, so let's take, say, people who are, are doing this professionally as sailors, using this type of data in this weather in this way, and then uh, having take, then having an artist perhaps, you know, take that same information and interpreting it. Mm -hmm. But the sailor is the public in this case. And the sailor has this orientation to weather and data that is a very serious, has very serious meaning. And so how, you know, so it's a way of, I don't know if I'm explaining this very, really very well, but I know some, some sailors or some people within the marine industry might just go, why, why, how do I understand this? Or why would I be interested in this other interpretation of this data? Well, I, I think, sorry, but I think what, I mean, I think what you're saying is almost exactly what I was just talking about before, which is that there's a, a way of taking a stream of data and doing something to it to make it more comprehensible in its original intent. Like if you want to know that these, you know, one reading every two seconds of the wind force, you're not going to read a spreadsheet right. of that. You're going to want a, some kind of graphic that, you know, delivers that information as quickly and efficiently and as accurately as possible. And that's the kind of first sort of thing that I was talking about. And what you don't, as an offshore sailor, want is an artist saying, like, coldness is upon us. That's like, that's, an, uh, that's a response to that saying data that doesn't do you as a sailor any good. And so I think that, that you know, I think that this is a really interesting question. And there may be, and, and it is directly a result of what the audience wants from the data. Does the audience want, you know, information right now or do they want their kind of understanding shifted and I think you know what what we did on the Manhattan thing was took something that might possibly have seemed dry and turned it into this very kind of emotional thing of like oh pretty pictures and the sunset and the birds and that 
you know, that supported by all of Eric's work gets at the, you know, the kind of message, uh, the overall big picture message that I think he wanted to send by doing that work, which is care about this place. You should also take into account that there are artists who manipulate data and like, where, where the integrity piece comes into play or is revealed or acknowledged in terms of like fabricating or fictionalizing and because that can be an interesting tension. Mm. Oh yeah, through. Um, I have a, um, an example of the, sort of the tension between a uh, scientist and an artist is um, a couple of years ago, Jennifer Lances, who is um, in charge of public art um, for the city parks department, she asked, we're, I'm working with a colleague, to a couple of colleagues to catalog all the wild plants in Central Park, and because it's such a um, well-known, iconic place, it um, has uh, gotten some attention, and she asked us to allow some artists to accompany us on a couple of our field days in Central Park, just going around cataloging all the wild plants in the park. And I was very excited about it and, um, you know, thought of all the potential, um, what was possible working with some artists, um, you know, kind of on the lines of Manhattan or something, kind of grandiose. Um, but I also um, have a certain amount of humility and um, don't did not want to control the process or control the outcome because I know that artists also have their preconceived ideas and their um, objectives and we didn't really sit down and and talk about you know what what is your objective and what is our objective we just sort of met in the park and walked around for a couple of days and um, Sort of um, left it at that, and at the end of it, um, the, um, Ellie and, and her colleague produced this really beautiful uh, work of art. Um, it was a couple of different pieces, but one of them was a calendar of the year of different plants in Central Park uh, extracted with their pigments. So they extracted pigments from various plants throughout the year, collected in the park um, and other parts of New York City and made a calendar of different color, kind of colored blobs throughout the year. And um, one of, uh, several of the plants, actually most of them turned out to be invasive species. And uh, you know, that's kind of my um, um, nemesis is, you know, I'm really an advocate for uh, managing invasive species and not letting them take over our um, natural areas. And it, it was a bit disconcerting to see them presented in a beautiful way and to kind of give them um, a platform and credibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a, um, a little bit disturbed by that, but um, I think that sometimes we have to let go of the outcome and just kind of be open to the process. And um, I think that ultimately, it, it does chip away a little bit at the plant blindness, so people do see that there's lots of diversity in Central Park, and you know, some of it is native, and some of it is non-native. Um, Did the words expectation or outputs pass anyone's lips during your walk around Central Park, or was no. it completely open? No. Um, so yep. we were open, um, and I think that was, that was a good thing. But you know, it may not always work out that way, um, for example, um, some of your work has been more directed from the beginning. Right. Kevin, Kevin was that yeah. in response to that? Well, I'm just going to respond to that and then I have a question. The, so my experience, you know, again, being, a, being at a field station with, with scientists um, was just the difference, different ways of knowing. And um, just appreciating their knowledge and what I could learn from that. Um, and I heard later from a scientist at the preserve saying that usually when artists come to the, the field station, they just tend to sort of gravitate to whatever's right around them and they miss what's really going on um, that the scientists are seeing because the scientists are there kind of year in, year out, and having the sort of long, uh, long term view. And, uh, you know, and I did a couple of walks with these scientists and you know I, I literally saw things that I would never have seen without them and I think that's a reciprocal 
um, possibility. It's just it's different ways of seeing. And what really intrigues me is this idea of the, the terrain or the subject, whatever it is, and having these two different ways of, of understanding operating in parallel. So it's not making artists and scientists or scientists or, or whatever. Um, it's everybody doing their own thing, but around a similar shared um, body of information or uh, possible knowledge. One needs to be able to, to try and counter people, other people where they are. So, right, and I think, and I think there's so much going on now in the, in the art world about um, place-based work, and it's intriguing to me that so much science is really place-based as well, and that also creates this grounds for collaboration. Um, Before you check stuff, don't check stuff again. There's one down here, I think. Yeah. There, uh, Lindsay, you'll be, you'll be third. You, okay. Then Eric, and then Lindsay. So you're. Oh, I'm first. Yep, you're okay. first. Um, sort of in response to, I actually think that's a great outcome. Uh, artists aren't mission driven in the same way that institutions are or organizations. So that's something to remember when working with artists is that they're not going to have the same mission. But I think that, like you know, uh, like invasive species exist, and so these artists were recognizing their existence and showing that they can have a use besides like mess everything up for native plants, right? You know, so I think like it's actually like it's extending because their audience is also the public. It's not um, people who it's not scientists necessarily, which maybe goes back to the sailor metaphor, which is that maybe the audience isn't the sailors, it's the public who doesn't know that sailors use weather in this way. And so the artists are interpreting the sailors' use of the weather for the public. So I think like, you know, as an artist, speaking as an artist, like I think that's a fabulous outcome that they had a calendar. And I think it's also fabulous that you're uncomfortable with it. <laughs> so you know, because that's that's part of the story, right? And so like, you know, even to take that a step further is to like explore, you know, and I know I think I know the artists you're talking about, and I know that's probably not necessarily where they would go with it, but like to explore like the tensions as an art project between um, like uh, botanists and um, habitat, um, I don't know, I'm blanking on like what that person would be like, habitat um, con con conservators or something like that, you know, and like plants themselves and like what plants do and what invasive species do and stuff like that. So. Well, it did really open my eyes and um, yeah. it, it um, suggested to me that maybe I need to do something different because, you know, there, there are very few. Um, ocean-going sailors in the world, and most of us are land lovers, and so, you know, I need to find a way to talk to the people on the land. Uh, Eric, and then Lindsay, and then Erica. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, um, uh, we should be careful about uh, the intention of science as such, because science doesn't go, like, in a straight line, it goes like this, you know what I mean? Like, when I started the Manahattan Project, it was just like, Oh, that's a cool old map. I wonder if I can do something with it, you know, like that. It was just kind of curiosity. And then there was a middle part of the project that was like, oh, I wonder if I could build a whole landscape from that. And it was only, only later that we kind of, and, you know, and I think this actually was interaction with Mark and a lot of other people, this sort of conservation messages. And now, and now it's like urban planning message, really. Um, but it, you know, I, I had a professor in graduate school, and he said, he said, you know, we, we always write the paper like we did this, and then we did this, and we did this, and we conclude that, and that's the result. But in fact, the process is like this, and then you go back and you rechart it as if it was a straight line. Mm -hmm. I want you to go, the artists would describe their process in a similar way. You know, the model here we have at the field station was started from this notion of bring scientists together with land managers, practitioners. And, and the notion was scientists would be driven by the theory, and the land managers, folks like Bram, would tell us what was happening in the field. And together, we would co-create a question, a methodology, uh, a type of analysis, and products. I mean, that, that's how it's set up to work. I agree with you in that, in practice, it's hard, right? And we get into our silos and we create, and we're always looking for those moments. But I think at the end of the day, maybe, I don't know, just reflecting as a practicing scientist, and one that works with a lot of other scientists who do get frustrated working with anyone outside their discipline, outside their academic discipline, and God help them working with a journalist, <laughs> got that story wrong, or an artist who just interpreted something that they don't even recognize anymore. But they're fools in that, you know, does science really work like that? Are we looking for the absolute truth? Are we trying to present the 
the, the facts? Yes, but it never, it's like a game of telephone. I'll tell you what uh, my big science finding was last year, that uh, when you engage people in planting trees, they, um, for the first time, it gives them the confidence to do other things in their community. Now, that's my science fact. If I tell it to you, and you tell it to her, and so on and so forth, it's all of a sudden gonna get translated in this crazy way towards the end, and November's gonna say something that's interpretive of all of our you know, experiences. And that's the way it works all the time. Whether you're working with, you know, that's the, the way, you know, at the end of the day, um, that's how Congress makes a lot of decisions. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we like to believe it's based on the facts, but we all know it's based on the storyline, the narrative, what we wrap around these issues. And I think that's really important for us to remember. So in whatever endeavor we're, we embark on, it's not to get it right. It's to, uh, you said something uh, over here, you know, to create that new experience, or to create new meaning, to create new knowledge. I mean, and that is, I think, our end point of what like, we're after through this process, which I think is super exciting. So Eric, you're right, science is, this crazy, wacky, irrational path. And you know, the more we talk about that, and I think we're open about that, and not to say it's this ivory tower of perfection, you know. Sprinkles from the mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we make a lot more friends. Thinking back to other examples of how other cultural organizations are working and starting these conversations, I just wanted to say something about the value of a uh, multi-tiered process. Like, so at Wayfarm, we have short artist residencies, and then the long-term installations come through relationships we develop in the shorter residencies. So like Heidi, uh, an installation at Wave Farm, she started as a resident, we developed a relationship, we could then propose something that was more long-term, and that kind of that trust and conversation and working relationship develops, and it seems like that's, maybe it's just so obvious, I should maybe be giving it lip service, but especially if you're bringing groups of artists and scientists together and you're hoping that they're going to develop something that's intimate and full of trust. Something small and at the surface first, I think, is really critical, and then you see what comes from that. Like, even here at the field station, hearing that the residencies or the engagements are a full year, I thought, oh, wow. Like, I could imagine something much shorter and then maybe a single project an artist is selected from that first group that is given much more financial support and much more time and space to really cultivate something because it's only been proven to be successful. Um, Erica, Stephanie, and then I'm going to change the conversation. So, oh, Erica. okay. I'll, well, just just wanted to um, just really express how much this notion of trust is resonating with me and my experiences working in, with various folks, and this notion of embeddedness is really important. You know, I'm just thinking, reflective, okay, so we're, we work for the U.S. Forest Service. And it's true, if we did that kind of research in Central Park with invasives, in the end, because of the context and where it is and the issue, we say, you know what, the outcome isn't so bad. Invasives are beautiful. And in many ways, many people admire them, and they're there, and they're functional. And there's a debate in science about it right now, about you know whether these land, you know, you know this and the other thing. But if you're on a fire line and you're in Missoula, Montana, and you're the fire division, and you're trying to, and they're coming down to like saving people's lives, do you want someone like who doesn't know anything, sniffing in, reflecting on their craft, and being like, yeah, let's point the fire in this direction? I mean, no. But if, I will tell you, in Missoula, Montana, there's been artists. There's been people working alongside fire scientists who are embedded, who have built trust, and are part of that conversation. So I think our task is how do we create opportunities where um, you know people from different disciplines have the length of time to spend together, you know, the embeddedness to build trust, so it's not an in and out kind of thing. I think Kevin said it too. You know, how do you how do you have this this experience for longer periods of time? So that you're really knowing that landscape as well as the scientist or the presumed expert, you know, so that you're met on equal footing, uh, and then then you see what comes out of that. Uh, it's, it, it, then you have the trust and to say, you know what, this thing about invasives and natives, uh, you know, is, is a real issue, and and they, let's look at it. And so I just wanted to make that reflection.